The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so today our topic is going to be depth perception, which as I have mentioned to you before, is certainly one of the most intriguing achievements in vision, uh, because the impressions onto the retinal surface are essentially two-dimensional. And from that, somehow, the brain needs to reconstruct the third dimension. And what is interesting about this also, that even in the most primitive animals, uh, this is a must. And so animals with tiny brains also have mechanisms to be able to calculate depth uh, from the information that comes in through their eyes. And to demonstrate that, I have here a frog, uh, which has a tiny little brain like that, has big eyes. And this frog, uh, for its existence, needs to know exactly where things are in depth, because if he doesn't, he would starve to death. And so what a frog does looks something like this very crudely. He will stick out his tongue, grab a flying insect, and consume it. And because of this incredible capability, uh, it is a well-adjusted, healthy animal in most uh, parts of the world. Now, the big question then comes up, how do we carry out these computations? Uh, what kind of mechanisms are involved in being able to compute where things are in space, either in an absolute sense, where it is from you, and in a relative sense, where one object is relative to another one. Now, it turns out that this uh, became such a serious problem in the course of evolution that actually several different mechanisms uh, have evolved to make possible our ability to see things in depth. And so when one looks at this uh, as a list, as a fairly brief list, we can make a distinction between so-called oculomotor cues and visual cues. The oculomotor cues are accommodation and virgins. So if various objects are at a very distance from you, or your eyes converge or diverge, and you, your uh, lens gets thicker and thinner, and that information can be utilized in a rather crude way to tell you about where things are in depth relative to you. Uh, now, as far as visual cues are concerned, the very significant one we're going to talk about quite a bit is a binocular cue, which is called stereopsis, as you all know. And then we have a whole bunch of monocular cues, motion parallax, shading, interposition size, and perspective. And so we will talk about many of these uh, to give you a sense of uh, what it is like and to give you a sense of what various brain structures do with this as a result of uh, extensive research that had been done in this area. So now, first of all, let's talk about stereopsis. And we talk about stereopsis, we're going to talk about the basic facts of it, and then we're going to have some demonstrations. First of all, uh, the so-called stereoscope, of which you have a modern version that has hand been handed out to you, the uh, stereoscope was invented in the late 19th century. And when that was done, uh, the initial approach to this was to be able to present to each eye separately an image uh, that was taken by a camera that has two lenses, which are apart about as much as your two eyes are apart. And each of those created a separate image of what's out there. And of course, each eye gets a very slightly different perspective of what's there. And then when you present these two images that you had collected separately to each eye, you get a very strong sense of real depth, as you'll see in just a minute. Now, another way to do it, which uh, nowadays is easier because uh, you, you can barely ever find even one of these two lens cameras in, even in, in, in uh, uh, stores that sell ancient materials, antique stores. Uh, 
So sometimes what you do instead, if you only want to take a picture of a static image, that you can take a camera, put it on a track, and ha take, have it take two pictures in succession. And then you can do the same thing as you do uh, with a serial camera. You can present one to each eye. OK, so um, what we are going to do now, we are going to have a series of demos. And so we have a handout for each of you, the paper. And that you can keep and take home. But the uh, stereoscope that I'm, I have for each of you, that you're going to have to leave behind because I need to, to the, use that in other classes. OK, so what you, I want you to do then, uh, there are two pictures in the first page that you put the stereoscope down onto the page so that the vertical line cuts it in half so that one goes into each eye. And then you put your head right down to it to look into it. All right, And if you do that, if you have a probably section, you're going to have a sense that that image is actually three-dimensional. Uh, it's an ancient, ancient old picture on purpose. Uh, but um, you should still be able to see it in depth. So that's the um, initial thing. This became quite a parlor game. And for decades, for many, many decades, whenever you went to a party, they would hand out to you a stereoscope, a handheld one, and they would show you all kinds of images. And you can even do this today when you uh, get on the internet to find such displays. Now, um, then a very important discovery was made. I shouldn't say discovery, really. I should say an invention was made by Bela Ulas, who came up with the so-called random dot stereograms. Uh, by the way, don't look at the bottom one. That, that just tells you what it's going to look like. There's nothing to look at the, at the bottom, OK, the bottom set. Now, if you look in the middle set, that looks like a random dust stereogram. And the idea here was that the only cue that you provide is stereo cue, nothing else. It's pure. And so what can be done here, you can take a section of here, or, or the same on each side, and simply move a, f a few pixels those images as a unit over. And when you do that, they're going to stick out in depth. OK? So if you now take your stereoscope and look in the middle display, and you look through it, you should see something sticking out in depth. Um, and the first question I'm going to ask you is, how many of you can see something stick out in depth? OK, what do you see? Square. You see a, you little, see a little square sticking out? All right, so now uh, the bot the bo don't, don't try to look at the bottom one. That simply tells you what the procedure was. How in that center section where you see the square sticking out, the um, pixels were moved a few steps inward from the, both from the left and to the right, creating what is called a disparity. And that's what the brain then can calculate for depth. So now to provide you with the acid test, Let's go to the second page. Now you look at the second page. Can everybody see the letter on top? You don't even have to need, look through the, the, the stereoscope. Obviously, you see the letter E, right? Uh, that's because th that section is made darker. But now if you do the same thing at the bottom, the only cue you have is the disparity cue. And the big question comes up, what letter do you see there? OK? And let me just add, this can be used as a quick general test. You can present these <coughs> to subjects. And if they can present a whole bunch of different letters. And if they can see the letters, that means they can see stereo. If they cannot see the letters, then it looks like they may not see stereo. Now let me add one other fact here. That the, as you move these progressively closer to each other like this, uh, you increase the disparity. And that causes the image to be seen at, at, at increasing depth. Okay? Our sensitivity is so great that when you look at this on a computer, uh, a standard computer, if you move uh, those images just one pixel uh, from the left to the right and from the right to the left, you will see it in depth. And even monkeys can see uh, as small a step as one pixel. So now, how many of you can tell me what was the letter at the bottom there? H. H, H, good. Anybody not being able to see the letter? Everybody sees it. Well, you guys are lucky, because 
there are a significant number of people in the world who lack stereopsis. Uh, something like 5 to 10 percent of the population lacks stereopsis. For a variety of reasons, we'll talk about that a bit more later. But um, one is sometimes you're born and you're embryopic in one eye. Uh, sometimes you are strabismic, which means that your two eyes are not aligned, uh, which in commonplace language is often called as being cross-eyed or wall-eyed. Those types of people very seldom will have stereoscopic depth perception. Even, af even after it's corrected, especially if the correction is made uh, by the time you're 8 or 10 years old, the correction won't help. It has to be done much, much earlier. All right, so that then is the, the very, very basics of the uh, stereo procedures. And now another procedure that had been developed uh, more recently is one which is called the autostereogram. So then if you go to the next page, and what you want to do is you want to look at this horizontally, like that, with a T on top. Uh, and then you just look at it at, at, at sort of, I don't know, maybe about, about 20 inches from you, normal reading length. And what you want to do is to sort of look beyond it, so stare beyond it. And if you keep doing that for a while, you will suddenly see an image, a three-dimensional image, as this comes actually from a book called The Magic Eye. There are several Magic Eye books in which all kinds of displays are done using this uh, uh, autostereograms. Does everybody see? Who, who can see what's up, out, sticking out? OK, what do you see? You see a shark? OK. Now let me see if any of you doesn't see it. Keep staring at it. Look beyond it. And another thing that helps, if you look at it, bring it a little closer to you so you can look beyond it easier, gradually move it back and forth. And if you're patient, eventually you may be able to do this. The reason this is difficult is because you have to uncouple the, the virgins in your two eyes. You have to look beyond it slightly. And in fact, um, that is one of the reasons why testing people for stereopsis an autostereogram is not a very good procedure, whereas virtually everybody uh, can use a stereoscope without any trouble. Uh, did you get it, finally? Yeah, that's so cool. uh, yeah? All right, so if, if anybody is really interested in these autostereograms, as I say, go to the store, the bookstore, and get one of those magic eye books. They're just a lot of fun, and you can just leaf through it. You don't even have to buy the book. Just look through it <laughs> at the store, and you'll see one interesting, clever image after the next. All right, so that's the stereoscope. And now let me explain to you, I think I've mentioned this to you briefly before, the principles involved behind uh, being able to see stereoscopic depth perception. And what I've mentioned to you before was that if you have the two eyes fixating at a particular distance, if you then draw a circle around that, that's sometimes called the Wieth Müller circle, or sometimes called the Horopter, then any target, like this one here, will hit equivalent points on the retinal surface of the left and right eyes. However, if you do the same thing and you put a target either beyond or closer than the Wieth Müller circle, then they're going to hit non-equivalent points on the retinal surface. So then by non-equivalence here, we can do this, we can calculate this as to where the image falls relative to the, relative to the uh, uh, central fixation spot in the foveola. Uh, and so then, when these non-equivalent points are hit, somehow the brain can measure this non-equivalence. And that is then converted into an estimate of where things are in depth. Now the, the idea behind this was that these non-equivalent points that you have on the retinal surface can connect in the cortex to single cells. So they have a cell in the cortex that is binocular by virtue of the fact that inputs from the left and right eyes, but they don't necessarily have to come sorry, from uh, uh, equivalent points. They can come from non-equivalent points. 
And that may be then the mechanism whereby it can tell you the degree of uh, non-equivalence and therefore convert that into depth. And therefore, there could be single neurons in the brain that are selected to certain depths. And so people began to do all kinds of experiments with this. And the way this experiment, these experiments were done is you presented images separately to the left eyes and right eyes. Uh, and you could then present them to both eyes at the same time and vary the amount of disparity systematically to see what kind of tuning function you would get in the cortex. So this, uh, some of the most beautiful work of this was done by a person called John Poggio. Uh, and I will tell you briefly about some of his experiments. So here we go then, I'm going to look at the neural responses, neural responses in, uh, in V1 as initially done in the monkey. Okay, so here's an example of a cell. We have here different degrees of uh, disparity, all right? And we have a se the neuro neuro neuron responding each time there are four repeated trials. And you can see the action potentials by these uh, dark lines here. And what you do is you move the stimuli back and forth across the two eyes. The, the way it's actually done, you have a mirror, and then you have two, in this experiment, you have uh, two monitors, one to the left and one to the right, and then you can set it up almost exactly the same as what you would do with a stereoscope. So this particular cell, as you can readily see, responds best when there's zero disparity, okay? Now, by contrast, here is a cell that responds vigorously at, at, uh, at the far disparity and not to the close one, okay? So then, when you do this, you can study hundreds of cells to see what kinds of distributions you have in the cortex for different degrees of disparity selectivity. Now, again, this harkens back to what I talked about in, uh, with respect to color vision, where the question came up, if you want to see color, how many receptors would you need that peak at different wavelengths, right? And one idea was that maybe you need, need as many, color, uh, many uh, photoreceptors as their colors. But in the end, it turned out that uh, we have only three of them, OK? And on the basis of that, we can recreate all the colors out there. Now, the same thing applies to stereopsis. So when this was done systematically, here's an example of the tuning functions. This, this one here is the same, very much the same as the first figure I showed you, OK? Uh, and so we have a bunch of different ones. And if you then study, as I've said, hundreds of cells, you can come up with a distribution of this. And what Jean Poitier came up with, he thought that there were four, four major classes. And the relative amount of activity of these four major classes then is used to compute all the very fine differences in depth. So there's a right on one. OK, this is uh, uh, this cell is right on the fixation spot, OK? And then you have near and far cells, and you have some in between cells. Initially, they, he thought there were four classes. Some people argue that there may be as many as six. But at any rate, there's a limited number on the basis of which we can calculate almost an unlimited number of depths, which is quite remarkable. All right, so now uh, what we can next turn to is to ask the question, to what degree do various extrastriate areas contribute to stereoscopic depth perception? And some people thought that uh, this is a unique function for area MT. Some people argued that maybe it's, it's area V4. And so experiments were done in which it was examined to what degree um, stereoscopic depth perception is altered when you eliminate say, area MT, or you eliminate uh, area V4. So that is what's been done. And you can think about it for a minute and say, well, what do you think, what do you think would happen uh, in a monkey once he had no longer had area V4? What do you think would happen if the monkey no longer had area MT? Well, the results were actually quite surprising, and they are shown here, same experiment as before, 
the Bela U.S. random dust stereograms, and then you present in one of four locations, or however many, uh, a little area with like a little square that sticks out in depth, and you vary the amount of depth it sticks out by, by varying the number of, of pixels you moved the images in the two uh, displays. And if that, and that was done systematically, this is what was found. It was found that neither a V4 lesion nor an MT lesion uh, caused a significant deficit. The only deficit that was significant it had to do with the response latency. And as I've, I should have mentioned earlier, like when we talked about the uh, frog, one of the very important things about processing depth, again, is to be able to do it quickly. So when you have that frog and that fly is flying along, he has to be very quick to compute it so that he can catch it, right, as you had seen. Uh, so in this case, what you see here, that there is about a 20 millisecond difference after V4 lesion, increase in latency, and quite a bit more, almost 40, 30, 30, 40, after an MT lesion. So they contribute to some aspect of depth proce processing in terms of being able to do it quickly. But neither system, neither the v MT or V4 are unique in processing stereopsis. It looks like that it is processed in several different areas in the brain and it's by a conjoint uh, computation that you can arrive at the actual depth, and it's by virtue of that joint computation that you can do this very quickly. All right, so now we come to the next um, important depth cue, which is called motion parallax. This one is... Uh, a capacity that we had uh, acquired in the course of evolution, which is extremely potent and powerful, and is based on a very simple physical fact. The physical fact is that either when you are in motion or something in the environment is in motion, the rate at which these images travel across the retinal surface is heavily distance dependent. And so let me demonstrate this concretely for you. Here we have an eye that's fixed. It's always looking straight ahead. And we have a, two rods here. Sorry, just one rod that we are going to move into two, into two positions gradually from here to here and then back up as shown by the arrows here. And we examine the range over which these near and far and middle objects move across the retinal surface when you engage in this motion and the eye is stable. And you can see that the far object moves over a much shorter distance than the near object, okay? This you can readily do yourself in an experiment. You can stick out your thumb and move your head back and forth and you see that your thumb will move a lot more uh, than uh, the object that you're looking at, okay? So, now the same thing also applies when you actually engage in eye movements, which of course you do all the time. In this case, the eye is set up so that it fixates initially in this object and then tracks it to here and then tracks it back. And when you do that, you get the same kind of effect, namely that the distance over which a far and a near object move uh, is quite different. The uh, near object moves over a much, much greater distance than the far object even though the eyes are tracking, all right? So this then, uh, being a basic physical fact, was then uh, used in the course of evolution to create mechanisms that are sensitive to this differential motion. And of course, because of the, the rate of motion also varies a little bit, uh, it became possible to create mechanisms to co make that computation to tell you where things are in depth. So here I'm going to show you an actual demo of this to make it, cl make it clear to you. In this case, again, we have uh, a bunch of random dots, much like in the below U.S. random dot stereograms, but just a single one. And everybody agrees there's no depth here. Is there any depth? You see any depth? Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this image into rocking motion. And when I do this, 
almost instantly you're going to see something in depth. Are you ready? So what you see here is uh, are three levels, right, very clearly. In, in milliseconds, in, in 20 milliseconds, you can see this. And let me explain to you what, why you see this. If, if, OK, let me go back and do it again. If I keep this stable, you can see that the, the dots move over a great distance here, a lesser distance here, and practically not at all here, OK? So there's a differential motion. And the greater the motion, the closer the image is in your analysis. So that's called uh, motion parallax. And then what you can do, actually, uh, you can play all kinds of games through experiments in which you can present the, this kind of image. Uh, you can put this into each of the eyes separately. And you can present this image alone, or you can present it paired with uh, uh, disparity for stereopsis. And you can do each separately, or you can do the two together. So uh, let's now uh, first summarize the essence of motion parallax. To derive depth information for motion parallax, neurons are needed that provide information about velocity and direction of motion, and perhaps also about differential motion. Secondly, uh, the majority of V1 cells are direction and velocity selective, as we had discussed before. And some appear also to be selective for differential motion, um, which I did not mention before. But indeed, there are such cells in the visual cortex. Uh, now, the third important point is that such cells that are motion selective and direction selective and selective for differential motion are very, very common ar area MT. So those are some of the very, very basic facts. And now we can move on and ask what kind of brain activation occurs by stereopsis and motion parallax in normal and serioblind subjects using a recently developed technique, which is magnetic resonance imaging, functional, function, functional magnetic resonance imaging. So how do you do this kind of stuff? Well, what you do here, uh, here's an example. You have a very large stereoscope with a mirror at the end. And you have a subject who is lying down. And this whole unit, except not, of course, that part, is put into the magnet. Just, and we have a magnet down here at MIT. Uh, most of you probably have seen that. It's on the ground floor. So you can do this. And then you can present those images here. And since it's a stereoscope, you present two images. And then you can vary. Uh, this by rocking them back and forth, is it either to present only motion parallax, to present only stereopsis, and to present both. And so now the question is, this is a very primitive <coughs> question at this stage, uh, where in the brain are these uh, processes analyzed? And so you can find out what brain areas are active by doing this repeatedly. Uh, collecting the fMRI data, and then printing them out and looking at them to see what happens. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that. Here is the basic figure that the, that the person sees, but done in such a way that you can see it. Of course, he doesn't see anything like this. He just sees different depths. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different depths here. All right, And this rocks back and forth. And then you can, as I say, present this only with differential motion, or you can present it only with uh, disparity, or you can present it with both. And then finally, as a control, what you do is you can do the same thing, but you don't have any depth of any sort. You just have a flat surface rocking back and forth. And then when you do your data analysis, you actually subtract that last one from the rest of the data so that you, you, you're not looking at the data for the activation just, just by the spots, but for the activation that's specific for stereopsis or motion parallax. So now if you do this experiment, here's an example of a normal subject and a stereoblind subject. And we have here a sagittal cut adding up the images sideways. And what you see here, this is posterior cortex, of course. Here in the normal subject, when you present only motion parallax. You only analyze the motion parallax part. You have a huge amount of activation 
in the visual areas. And then if you do the same thing when you do it binocular stereopsis only, you also get a great deal of activation quite in a quite similar set of areas. <clears throat> and then the big crucial test comes up. What happens if you present the stereo under monocular conditions when you don't see stereo? And if you do that, uh, using these same calculation procedures, there, there is no brain activation here. And therefore, what we see here is due indeed to the analysis that we do for uh, stereopsis. Now, if you do the same experiment in a stereoblind subject who has been tested on test similar we had, we had shown you, uh, when that person even he looks, under, uh, looks at it under binocular conditions, there is no brain activation, meaning that this person doesn't have any mechanisms in the brain to analyze uh, stereopsis. Now, the fortunate thing is that we have these several different mechanisms for depth perception. And so people who are stereoblind uh, and have, have no, no analysis for, for disparity, they can still see depth reasonably well. And indeed, they can get driver's license and all that because we have all these other mechanisms that include, that we have talked about, uh, <coughs> motion parallax. All right, so that then is one way of looking at it. Now, the other way to look at it, especially if you want to ask as well, uh, are the same brain, brain areas doing both or what? And so what you can do is instead of doing a sagittal section, you can take sections coronally, like bang, 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 like that, and see what that looks like. And here's an example uh, in which you've isolated the stereo. And here are a bunch of sections. And this shows the activation for uh, stereopsis. You can see that there are all kinds of areas that are being activated. Uh, and then if you do the same thing and just look at the uh, parallax alone, here we have this, uh, the activation for that. And then lastly, here we have and do both of them. Now we can go back. The way to look at the question, how these two areas, uh, these, these two types of uh, depth perception analyses differently activating in the brain. And so I'm going to go back and forth between stereo and parallax. You can see, and that you can see the difference. There are some regions which have a perfect overlap, and there are some regions that are quite separate. Notable here are these areas here, which are activated by stereo, but not by parallax. So this then can provide you with an initial idea that there are some brain areas in which both of these are analyzed together, and there are some brain areas in which they are uniquely analyzed for either stereopsis or motion parallax alone. Now, this tells you where it takes place in the brain. But how it takes place requires a totally different approach, namely, to, most comfortably, to record from individual neurons in various areas, just like I had shown you that nice work that done by John Poggio uh, recording from V1, demonstrating there that there are disparity selective neurons that are tuned that then provide the hardware, if you will, for being able to analyze stereoscopic depth. OK, so that then um, summarizes what I wanted to tell you about uh, motion parallax. And now we are going to go on and talk about yet another important depth cue that is utilized by the brain, which is called shading. Now, remember that our ability to use light to illuminate things uh, is something that was practically non-existent for, for endless millions of years. And so because of that, both animals and us, we had to heavily rely on information based on light coming from the sun, coming from above. And shading um, is based on those millions of years of evolution, utilizing the fact that most of the light that illuminates things comes from above. So there are all kinds of nice examples of this. And here is one of them. Um, what you can do here is you can take a bunch of uh, disks and set them up so you can do this on a computer 
to make the upper part light and the lower part dark, or the other way around, the upper part dark and lower part light. And all of you readily can see that these images of the, the first and third row seem to be protruding towards you, and the images in the second and fourth row seem to be receding. Now that is because the brain is interpreting uh, depth on the basis of the, of the fact that the light at least used to come predominantly from above. So that is the basic uh, arrangement for seeing depth. And now I'm going to give you some demonstrations to indicate that this cue is actually quite powerful, uh, even one you would not necessarily expect it to be. All right, so these Shading cues have also been extensively used in artwork to provide an impression of depth. Uh, and I will show you some examples that will give you a sense of how that is done. OK, so let me make one more point before I proceed, that namely, it is indeed the degree of, of illumination that's crucial here. We have the same change here from red to, uh, sorry, from, from sort of greenish to yellowish. And you have no sense of depth here whatsoever. In other words, you do need the uh, shading information, meaning the amount of light that is being reflected from various surfaces that is crucial for perceiving depth. All right, so now what we are going to do is we are going to present a series of slides that will highlight the power that shading has for the perception of depth. All right, so here. It's an example of how we do this. And the reason I'm showing this is some detail, because if you really are interested in stuff like this, you can do all this on your, on your own computer. You can play games, endless games with it. You can spend hours and hours having a lot of fun uh, thinking about how depth works on the basis of, of, of shading. So what we have here are a whole bunch of disks. And each of these can be shaded differently by many different computer programs, OK? Um, so that's what you can do. That's the basics. So now what we can do is we can play a game. And we can, say, present just two different objects here, all right? But we're going to present them repeatedly on a big display. And then we can shade these differently as we, as we please. So here is a whole bunch of them. And all the rows, this, the first, third, and so on rows, are the same shape and the second, fourth, and so on are the other shape, these two shapes, OK? So we only have two shapes here that are put juxtapositioned. Now what we can do is say, well, this is a peculiar sensation. Uh, I have sort of va vague sense of there's something maybe in, in the third dimension, but it's not too, not too well defined, because this is not in accordance with the rules and laws of shading of light coming from above. So now what we can do instead, we can selectively shade these to be in accordance with the rules of uh, light coming from above for, to create shading and depth. And when you do that, here's an example of that. Uh, what you can see here is a very compelling image of, of these uh, protruding elements sort of protruding to the left, right? Everybody see a strong, have a strong sense of depth here? OK. So now what you can do is you can play with it and decide, well, can we do something that uh, keeping the very, very same shapes, shade them differently, and see what it does to our perception of depth. And so what we are going to do next is we're going to take each of these elements here, the same ones here, and we're going to reverse the contrast. You see the contrast here is on, on top is white, and the bottom is black. So we're going to reverse that contrast. And when we do so, the question is, what are you going to see? And if you do that, lo and behold, you still have a strong sense of depth, but it's a very confusing sense. You may see sometimes the, the, uh, these objects uh, pointing to the left and sometimes to the right. It's unstable because you're confusing those computations that have evolved over millions of years for interpreting depth uh, in terms of shading. Now, you can play all sorts of additional 
games. You can make this even more complicated, make more changes. And here's another one. You still have a feeling of depth, but it's totally confusing. It's very hard. You can't organize it anyway because it is not in accordance with the law of uh, light coming from above to a real object. And lastly, you can also make this so that it would be in accordance with the laws, but you can change it around so that you get a completely different percept, still a strong sense of depth. It's still the very, very same elements that you had seen before, but now the shading is done again differently. And that now gives you, again, a unified sense of uh, a display uh, that uh, is, is not conflicting, because in this case, it's in accordance with the, some of the basic principles of shading. All right, so now what we can do next, having talked about stereo and we had talked about shading, is to look at some more of the demos. So let's go back now to the stereoscope and let's go back to the handouts. And so if you now come to the next page, okay, that has a heading called stereo and shading. So again, take the stereoscope, and we're going to look at these in steps. So start by looking at the top display first, which is called stereo only. So if you look at that, first of all, if you just look at it without the stereoscope, <coughs> you, you see pretty much a, a sort of flat uh, display of a truncated pyramid. Then if you put the stereoscope there and look through it, you should see, if you look at it for a little while, that one of those sticks out towards you, and the other one seems to recede. Does everybody see that? Mm -hmm. OK. So let's stop there for a minute, because I want to add one more fact here, which I should have mentioned earlier. So what you do here is, so you have these two displays like that, OK, and you have one image here, another image here. When you feel, this is greatly exaggerated. These coming together like this. That means it's going to stick out towards you as you look at it. But if you do the opposite, like that, OK, uh, they're further apart than the rest of them, then actually you see it receding. All right? And that's why you, if you now take away the stereoscope and look at it, you can see, if, see that uh, the top left images in each okay, are facing towards each other, whereas the other ones are facing away from each other. And that's what creates, that's what the brain interprets as protruding versus receding using the stereoscope. So that is very similar, in a way, to what happens with shading. So now if you look at the uh, second image there, first without the stereoscope, what you see here, again, is one that sticks out, just like uh, in, in the original display, and the rest of them are receding. That's because the shading, the one that sticks out, is light on top and dark on the bottom, and it's the obverse for the other ones. Now if you do the same thing looking at this through the stereoscope, what you will see is still some degree of depth, but it's not, not very pronounced, because there is no uh, corresponding disparity information. But now if you look at the third display, okay, where stereo and shading are in harmony, then what you see is an extremely compelling dramatic sense of depth with the top left one sticking out towards you and the other three receding. So shading appear to have added to the compelling nature of the depth that you see through the stereoscope. Now the last image in, the, in here is one where we put stereo and shading in conflict with each other. And when you do that, uh, you can sort of look at it first with just one eye, then with the other eye. When you look at it with both of them, you've, for a while you see something unstable. And when you see it well, eventually uh, you realize that there is a conflict there because of the shading and the uh, stereo being in opposition to each other. <clears throat> now then, this kind of effect, if you go to the next page, we're going to go now to page 5, 6, and 7. 
Again, what you need to do here is to look at it sideways, okay, with it with the F's on top. And when you look at this, those of you who, who can use uh, uh, your eyes so that they're divergent and you look beyond it, then this is very much like, or it is the same actually, as an autostereogram. So if you look at this for a while and you look beyond it, eventually it's going to gel. And when it gels, what you should see is where the F's are, the images are protruding towards you, and the others are receding. Now it may take you a while. It's much more difficult than what we just did with the stereoscope, but you should be able to uh, see that. How many of you are able to actually see those images? A little bit different. Move, your, move it back and forth a little bit slowly, and maybe eventually you manage it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so as I say, the, where the Fs are, you see these images, these uh, truncated primers protruding towards you, and the rest of them are receding. If you have difficulty seeing this, I'm not surprised because it takes a lot of practice. But once you get a sense of it, I think that um, you will enjoy doing this and actually showing it to some of your friends. So then if you go to the next page, uh, there we have added shading. And the shading is the same everywhere, but the uh, Stereo cues are not, because once again, what happens is that the uh, stereo cues where the Fs are stick out towards you a lot greater than the others. They stick out a lot less because of the added stereo. And then, in the last demo there, the last page, we are putting, just like in, in, in that figure with the stereoscope, uh, we are putting them into opposition with each other. And so when you look at this, it's, this would be really difficult to see for a while because there's a tendency uh, to see it differently uh, for stereo and for uh, motion parallax. And so it's going to be an unstable percept. So what you can do then is you can play around with this <coughs> at your leisure. And especially once you become more proficient, looking at all the stereograms, if you go and get one of these magic eye books to look at, um, you will have, you'll be able to so see these displays as well. <coughs> OK, so now this is, this is the one that, I that was the first one that I showed you. As I've said, this one, the Fs are the ones that should stick out closest to you. Once you see that, then you can go on to the next two to add the shading or subtract the shading from it. OK. So now, an interesting question that arises is to what degree Are we able, or are animals able, to integrate these different kinds of depth cues? And in particular, in this case, you're going to ask the question, what about uh, integrating stereopsis, parallax, and shading? Okay. So the experiment is one done on monkeys, in which you can present these cues either singly or in, a, in combination. And we can ask the question, well, does the monkey do better with one, with one or the other? Or does, it, does he integrate, really? And does really much better when you provide all three cues? And so here is a procedure. What you do here, again, you have a rocking display like this. And you can present this either with shading, as shown here, or with motion parallax, when it rocks back and forth. And lastly, also with uh, stereopsis. So if you do that, the results you get are quite dramatic. What happens is, shown here's a percent correct performance, and here is the latency in milliseconds. And it shows that the monkey does extremely well when you 
percent, this is percent correct. This is degrees of disparity. The market does extremely well when you present all three cues and does worse when you present each of those cues alone. Even more dramatic is the fact, and this is where I keep coming back to this, that the ability for us to respond quickly to things is very important for survival. Uh, and here what we can see is that when you present all three cues, performance is much, 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 much faster than when you present each of those alone. And of course, as you might expect, when you present parallax only, because that takes well, that's motion over time, that is the, takes the longest to do. So even though motion parallax cues are great, it became important in the course of evolution to create mechanisms that can detect these things more quickly and more efficiently. All right, so now we come to yet another cue that we know very little about at, at the level of uh, the brain or, or single units uh, because it's so complicated, which is called perspective. But I want you to just be aware of it and have a sense of it. And here is one of those cartoon examples that gives you a very strong sense of depth. And you, you almost cringe if you were there, you would worry that you'd be falling down. Uh, this is done stri strictly by virtue of perspective. It's very similar to what you encounter all the time. When you're driving down a road, the road seems to converge, even though you're not aware of it. But that's what's happening on the retinal surface, because things further away are smaller than things that are close by. And that's when you look down a railroad track, the same thing happens, even though you know that the railroad track is not converging. It's, it's going parallel. But because of the distances involved, uh, that's what falls in the retina. And you're smart enough to know uh, that even though that's what falls in the retina, you can make the right kind of interpretation. But conversely, you can also compute the depth on the basis of that kind of convergence. Now, here's another example of that, a much simpler way that people can do with experiments. Here we have a bunch of dots, and we have two basic uh, cues that have to do with perspective. One of them is the gradually decreasing size of these uh, uh, dots, OK? I should say elongated disks, if you will. And also that they are converging, much like a railroad track converges. And so you have a very strong sense uh, of having a third dimension here. Now, the fact that this is so strong can be um, mitigated by adding a few things here. If you add some more dots, it's not quite as, quite as dramatic. And then if you start mixing up the sizes, you're beginning to lose it. And then if you totally mix it up, then you have no sense of depth left at all. So it's that progression of steps in sizes and whatnot that gives you the sense of the depth of the images that you're looking at. OK, now here is another converse example of this that is an illusory effect that what you see here is a three uh, barrels, if you will. And this barrel is a lot bigger than this barrel, right? Or is it? Well, so what we are going to do here, we have an inducing element here by this hallway, if you will, with a door at the end. We're going to remove this hallway, keeping the uh, the uh, barrels exactly as they are. And if you do that, lo and behold, those barrels are all the same size. Yeah? It's induced by virtue of the surround that gives you a false sense of depth. So now, uh, let me show you yet another picture, because I'm on, I have a purpose behind this. This is a picture that's in, in, in a museum in Worcester, Massachusetts. And it was created by a fellow called Edward Savage. And it's a pretty un un unpleasant picture. But the main reason I'm showing this to you is that there seems to be a very poor sense of depth in this picture. Now, the reason this <coughs> is interesting is because when artists began centuries ago, in the 13th, 12th, centuries draw things, they did not have a concept of an understanding of how to create depth, a third dimension, in their drawings. So 
What they did eventually, they came up with the so-called vanishing point, and they drew very much like what we had here, lines that converged on, at a point, and then they scaled the images accordingly rather than keeping the same size, and that way you got a good sense of depth. So now, that has a number of interesting stories about it uh, <clears throat> that we are going to discuss next time when we talk about the uh, perception of shapes, okay, patterns. Uh, but I will leave that discussion until then. What I'm going to do next, however, I'm going to try to give you a sense of how important stereopsis can be for the perception of fine depths. All right? And so to do that, um, what I'm going I'm to show you actually a film. And here what we have is a so-called needle test. What you have here is a fine needle protruding. And here we have a bunch of different size uh, circular uh, openings, a little bit like a, a needle, all right? But it's round, all right? And the task is to take these one at a time and hang them up. And one can time how quickly you can do that, or you can make a film to see how well you can do it. And then what you can do is you can test the subject under binocular conditions and test them under monocular conditions. So I'm going to show you a film of this, actually two films. Uh, it will just take just a few seconds to do it. OK, well, be ready. It's going to come up in a second. OK, here's a subject under binocular viewing conditions. All right, so that's the uh, condition on the binocular viewing. And now I'm going to show it to you. Same subject, same time, but with one eye closed off. OK? All right, so that then, uh, just even just looking at it without taking any careful measurements, it's obvious that it's much, much more difficult to thread a needle on the, on the monocular than on the binocular viewing conditions. And so what you can do is when you go home and next time you want to saw something up, try threading the needle with one eye closed and with eye, the two eyes open, and you will see immediately what a huge difference it is. And that difference, therefore, is due to your having the mechanism of stereopsis. Just a few seconds here. Another test that has been used in a similar fashion, um, in which allows you to actually calculate exactly how, what your error is in reaching, is you can have a subject sit in front of a, one of these touch panels. 
and then do this experiment either binocularly or monocularly. And after he presses this, a dot comes up, and then the person has to touch it. And you have about 30 or 40 trials like that. And then you, can, you have recorded where the person touched, and therefore you can calculate the error between where he touched and where the dot is. And then again, you get a huge effect between monocular and binocular viewing conditions. Now, when you come to monocular and binocular viewing conditions, another thing important to test is to what degree a person who does or does not have stereopsis is capable of integrating information between the two eyes. So to do that, we have here examples of what is called binocular integration. So what we do here, again, you can use a stereoscope. You look at a monitor. And this you present to the left eye, this to the right eye, and you flash these on. If you integrate this, this is what you see. This would be actually what you would show in the control part of the experiment. Uh, so you see the Star of David. And if a subject is shown this, and they don't see the Star of David, you worry that their ability to integrate information between the two eyes is deficient. And, and I would say 90% of the cases, those people who are deficient on this also uh, show a major deficiency in stereoscopic viewing. Now, another way to do this is an experiment in which you can present two words here, sod and dry, to the two eyes separately. And when you present those simultaneously, you actually see the word sturdy. So you ask the subject, please tell us what do you see? What is the word you see? And the subject says sod when the subject says try, then you know that that subject uh, sees, if he says try, he sees mostly with his right eye and prefers it, doesn't see too well with his left eye. If he says sturdy, then he integrates the two, and therefore you can safely say that this guy has very good integration between the two eyes. All right, so uh, what I would like to do next, then, is to uh, provide you with any questions that you have. This was a complicated topic uh, that you have, and then we are going to summarize. Does anybody have a question about motion parallax, stereopsis, and so on? Let me maybe add one more important factor. You know, your eyes are separated only by so many uh, centimeters. Now, can you think of an animal where there's a much larger separation? The hammerhead shark, yeah? That has, has a separation of, 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 of over a foot between the two eyes. And so you can ask the question, why on earth did that animal evolve to have such a huge separation between the two eyes? Uh, well, that brings one to yet another interesting point. Uh, this, this, I think, may have started during the Second World War. Uh, it was realized that when you're flying over some territory where there, there are all kinds of weapons and whatnot which are well uh, camouflaged, that uh, just looking down at them, you can't see them. But obviously, if you're going to have a tank or you're going to have, a, ha have a, uh, uh, some, some gun or other that uh, maybe more like a cannon, uh, it sticks out of the ground. So it was discovered that if you had in your airplane two lenses which are far apart that would greatly magnify the depth, you could defeat that camouflage, and you could find those weapons down there by virtue of the fact they're sticking out of the ground. Yeah? So the fact then is that the more you separate the, uh, the, the images from the two, two eyes, if you will, or your two cameras, uh, the more likely it is that you can calculate the disparity of information between the two images. So <clears throat> that then is probably one of the reasons, maybe not the sole reason, but maybe one of the reasons <clears throat> why in some animals you is an excessive separation between the two eyes. 
And that brings me to yet, me to yet another point, which is that stereopsis actually works best at relatively short distances, like threading a needle. Uh, it doesn't work too well uh, beyond, I don't know, 10 feet or so. Uh, <clears throat> becomes progressively less effective. But at short distance, it's very effective. And so I presume also many animals that have to hunt for food um, are able to utilize the mechanism of stereopsis because everything is at a close distance when they hunt for food on the ground. Uh, and by contrast, when you talk about motion parallax, that works extremely well over very long distances. So does anybody have any questions about motion parallax or about uh, stereopsis? Well, once again, I'm crystal clear, huh? All right. So therefore, I think it's time for us to summarize what we had covered today. First of all, there are numerous mechanisms that have emerged uh, for analyzing depth. And they include the ones, the oculomotor cues, which are, are virgins in accommodation, and then the binocular cue of stereopsis, and then the monocular cues of parallax shading and perspective. Then we have several cortical structures that process stereopsis. You don't have one specific brain area that uniquely does this. Uh, the number of disparities that are represented in the brain, as studied in area V1 by John Poggio, is limited. There may be maybe four, but there may be six. But certainly, uh, there are not a large number of them. And so it's analogous to the way things had been resolved for us to be able to process uh, color. Utilizing motion parallax for depth processing necessitates neurons specific for direction, velocity, and differential velocity. Several areas including V1 and empty process motion parallax, um, which I did not say. But indeed, if you make a lesion in area MT, you do get a deficit in motion parallax even though you don't get a, a major deficit in stereopsis. Now, area MT combines the analysis of motion, motion parallax, depth, and flicker. However, these analyses are also carried out by several other structures, as I've already said. And lastly, little is known at present about the manner in which information uh, about shading and perspective are analyzed in the brain. And hopefully, that will be one of the future tasks by neuroscientists. And so if any of you will get involved uh, in neuroscience, this certainly is a big open area that uh, we hope people will start to analyze. So that then is the essence of what I wanted to cover today. And once again, if any of you has a question, please, please don't hesitate to ask. I'll be very happy to answer them. OK, lastly then, did everybody sign uh, the attendance sheet? If not, please come up after the class and sign your name to it. Very good. So next time then, we are going to talk about pattern perception. And uh, hopefully, you will find that also interesting. <laughs>